Hi, everybody. I'm Bernard Schwartz, the director of the 92nd Street Wise Unterberg Poetry Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's conversation between Sarah M. Broom and Saidia Hartman. Uh, I got a taste of their conversation uh, backstage a few minutes ago, and you're in for a treat. Uh, they'll be talking for about uh, 45 minutes. Uh, Sarah will do a, a short reading at some point. And uh, after about 45 minutes, um, I'll come back and uh, and ask Sarah, Saidia, the both of them, some of your questions. You can submit questions uh, via the chat function, and I encourage you uh, to do so. Um, that's really it for me. I hope you enjoy the show, and please welcome Sarah and Saidia. Thanks. Hello. I'm Saidia Hartman, and I just want to thank Bernard and the 92nd Street Y for hosting this conversation with Sarah Broom, the author of the wonderful The Yellow House. And so we thought we would start the evening um, with Sarah reading an excerpt from The Yellow House. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. So I'm just going to read from... Uh, the first movement of the book, which is called The World Before Me. In the world before me, the world into which I was born and the world to which I belong, my grandmother, my mother's mother, Amelia, was born in 1915 or 1916 to John Gant and Rosanna Perry, a shadow of a woman about whom only scratchings are known. Even the spelling of Rosanna's name is uncertain. She appears briefly in Lafouche Parish census records for 1910 and 1920. These papers tell us that my great-grandmother lived in Raceland, Louisiana, could not read or write, and that she had been widowed. Next to my great-grandmother Rosanna's name, no form of work was ever indicated. Those are the facts as they were recorded, but this is the story as the generations tell it. Rosanna Perry had these five children, Edna, Joseph, Freddie, my grandmother, Amelia, and Lily May. Doctors had warned Rosanna that another child would kill her. Still, Lily May was born in August 1921 when Amelia was five or six years old. It has always been said that my great-grandmother Rosanna Perry died in childbirth when she was 34. But those who might know are not alive to confirm, deny, or offer alternative theories, and burial records cannot be found. Whatever the facts, Rosanna disappeared. Of Rosanna's children, the only one ever to reside under the same roof with her was the son Joseph. Where her other four children went after being born, why they went, and with whom they lived is uncertain. And so even if Rosanna did not die giving birth to Lily May, my grandmother Amelia still would not have had a mother. Grandmother was born on Ormond Plantation, named after an Irish castle next to which the West Indies colonial style Louisiana replication would appear bedraggled and dim. Ormond sits haughtily still, it doesn't care along Louisiana's River Road, 70 miles of two lanes hugging tight to the curves of the Mississippi River, its waters hidden behind levees that look like molehills. The fabled Great Mississippi River Road, present-day brochures call it, its showy houses, gay piazzas, trim gardens, and numerous slave villages all clean and neat read the description during its pre-Civil War heyday when tons of white gold sugarcane were grown and processed in Louisiana, building generational wealth and power for white plantation owners. What modern marketers never tout is how in 1811, the largest slave revolt in American history, an army of 500 or so, wound its way along the river road for two days, strategically headed toward New Orleans to take over the city, stopping only to light plantations of fire after loading up on weaponry. They made it far, considering 20 of 41 miles, 
before a local white militia halted them. Some slaves escaped, others were shot on the spot. Of the unlucky ones put on trial, most had their heads severed and placed on poles atop the river road's levees, 40 miles of heads, the grisly trophies of petrified whites. Today, the pillared splendor of the river road's plantations is flanked and outmatched by petrochemical refineries, their silver nostrils blowing toxic smoke. Long before the near to end, when my grandmother would forget her life story, she claimed July 1916 as her birth date, even though it was officially recorded a year or two after the fact. Fixed details were important to stories, Amelia knew, even if you couldn't prove them. Sometime in Amelia's childhood, no one is sure exactly when, she left St. Rose where she was born for New Orleans, a 30 minute drive away to live with her eldest sister. Edna and Uncle Goody lived uptown on Phillips Street in a community of women where everyone called themselves something other than their given name, it seemed, where familial relationships were often based on need rather than blood. What you decided to call yourself, these women seemed to say, was genealogy too. Part of this community, people called her eldest sister Mama. Mama also answered to Aunt Shiga. Aunt Shiga's actual name was Bertha Rhines. She was also sister to Tante Swede, short for Sweetie. Aunt Shiga was the biological mother of a woman who only ever called herself T.T., with whom Amelia shared a sisterhood, even though they were cousins. These women who lived in close proximity composed a home. They were the real place, more real than the city of New Orleans where Amelia resided. In this world, Amelia became Lolo, another version of her name entirely, the origins of which no one can pinpoint. Everyone called her Lolo. No one uttered her given name again, not even her eventual children, which exacted on, which exacted on the one hand a distance between child and parent, and on the other, an unnatural closeness and knowing. Thank you. Thank you. That was that was lovely. And of course, in reading that selection, you kind of preempted my first question and sent me right to the heart of the book and so many things that I really love about the Yellow House. And I guess, um, you know, uh, it's called a memoir. Um, and in some ways, it really troubles our, you know, very strict understanding of what the memoir is. And um, in the selection that you read, we see that The Yellow House is a story of generations. So I, I wanted you to also just talk about that tension between something I might describe as personal history or like collective history and the memoir. And because in The Yellow House, um, really your eye be is subordinated to the we and the story of generations, and you're the one who winds up carrying all these stories. So um, if you could just say something about how you decided, why you decided to tell the story um, in the way that you did. And I don't know if you would then also want to speak a bit about the genesis of the book. That's great. I, I feel like you and I could have a, a really long party talking about what books are called, right? Um, because that, and I do want to talk a bit about that because, you know, as I was writing it, I mean, there is something I think deeply wrong with the categories assigned to books. Um, I understand why we need them, but, um, you know, this book is of course a memoir, but it leads me to wonder what's happening in the genre of memoir, right? Um, because for me, I, I felt always that I was writing an autobiography of a house. Um, and, 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 and that for me is so much about place and that requires that I hone in on a kind of contextual world 
and all of its sort of granularities and its richness. Um, and that doesn't allow, to be quite honest, for an eye, I think, in, in the culture that I'm talking about and writing about, um, which is a thing I had never seen before as a black New Orleans girl. Um, I had, I read thousands of books written about New Orleans in the process of working on this book. And I never ever saw anyone talking about their origin as a black American New Orleanian, uh, where they had come from. And for me, that I had to be subsumed because it was the only way that I could theoretically exist because the absence of that context, I think, feels like displacement to me. And in a book where I am also making commentary about movement and displacement and the particular feeling that many of us have of being untethered and unmoored, um, that certainly I couldn't in the framework of the book itself do that to myself, right? So I come with the chorus, as you might say, right? Because that is how I see myself as existing. Um, so for me, that also feels like part of the beginning of the book, which is trying to, as a writing person, you know, and a first book, as you know, is a peculiar thing. You're trying to say something about how you see things. And it's a halting, strange exercise, right? Somehow. But clearly, um, you know, there's so much that you got right. I mean, when I first read, when I read the first page about 4121, on Wilson Avenue, I immediately thought of 124 Bluestone Road. There we go. You know, and Morrison's beloved because, I mean, it is an autobiography of a house and all um, that it contains. And, you know, in the case of uh, the yellow house, that's loss and grief. And it's also secret and shame. I mean, I think that one of the things that I love about the book is that it has a breath, right? And that that house and the way it becomes the pivot for thinking about this like long history of black movement, black dispossession, the, um, the impossibility of really settling um, anywhere. In telling that grand story though, you never lose sight of the singularity of this yellow house and for me um that felt like an incredible achievement because so much of a certain you know compulsory address as a black writer is you know explaining oneself as a kind of general in a general state and in a general condition but there's so much uh that is particular i mean i say singularity you say granularity right mm -hmm. just in terms of about uh, the materiality of this particular house. Um, on that note, you know, in terms of thinking about it's the evolution of the project, I mean, I would like to hear more about it. I suspect that you never imagined this book as a, I'll put it in scare quotes, a, a Katrina book. Oh, and, wow. and, and I want you to, you know, I mean, I, I under, Stand that because I think that so I want you to say more about that. I mean, in reading the book, I feel like you shift our lens from understanding a kind of you know tragic news story or sociology of Black life to really thinking about how these histories of loss and dispossession are lived intimately. You know, I think part of this also is related to wh why. I didn't want to be a newspaper journalist anymore, uh, even though that was my training and my dream for a very long time. It's because I, I didn't feel that I could ever write accurately about anyone um, with that 
pace and and in that small amount of text. And, and there were so many times when I was a newspaper reporter where I would be begging in New Orleans to send me to the scene. I know this city, you know, send me, I'm not afraid. And, you know, these certain stories that I thought were so important to tell uh, never quite got told. And so it, I think in this work, it was important for me to hone in on this place because it is like so many places that me and my family members know that on the map, you know, if you look from the aerial shot, a block with no houses, this is not indistinct from what Toni Morrison kept trying to talk about um, in Sula right? When she talks about the bottom, right? There's this irony of, you know, she sets up for us this sort of community of people. And she's really also very obsessed with where they live and who they are in relation to each other. So for me, I think so much of the work was saying in terms of Katrina, you know, we just see these flashes and, and the ways that images are used to begin to stand in for uh, an entire story, to almost usurp the story itself, right? Um, it's it's like a, some kind of weird psychological test, right? You flash the image three times and someone automatically thinks of, of a certain thing. And I want it to get underneath that and inside of that and say, but what does it mean that we are a culture that allows images, right, to stand in for us? And when I say that, I feel it quite deeply. Um, you know, it's, it's such an unanswered question for me, but this was sort of the beginning of trying to explore it. Yeah, I Midian, mean, I think that you set that up beautifully from the very beginning. I mean, both the beginning of the book and the end, we have this notion of um, what the imposed map is, right? Or what the dominant map is. So through that map, you couldn't see your brother Carl um, mowing the lawn of the plot where the house no longer is. And um, at the end of the book, you return to that and you talk about what does it mean to make um, a plot of beauty from this like plot of ugliness. But I think that um, as the reader enters the book, you let us know, oh, I'm gonna kind of refocus your perspective. I'm actually going to train you um, how to see this world, how, how to look, how you might understand it. But um, I, you know, I mean, I guess another figure is also like the water um, mm -hmm. and why you use that which is like so important, not only for New Orleans, but just as a kind of a figure for this extended, you know, African diasporic experience of movement, of displacement, of exile. And yeah. yeah. I, I mean, it's interesting that you talk about this sort of beginning and the setup. And, you know, we all think about this when we begin books. And for the Yellow House, what I was trying to do in a lot of esoteric ways before it became a little more grounded was in the beginning provide a kind of snapshot of what each part of the book would ultimately do. And then we would see it sort of unfold, right, in the course of the book. And, you know, the moment of my brother Carl on the land gets to this this sense of unmoredness that I keep talking about, this sense that there is something greater than um, any of us, right? There's something at work here that it actually doesn't matter if he follows the rule. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, that that no matter what you do, there's a kind of sense that, that it might all come to ruin, right? Um, at any point. And so what happens in the interim? Uh, and, and I think that was hard to agitate in the book because as the person guiding the story, I'm also so accustomed to reading a story that 
plants us so firmly on the ground, right? That that doesn't necessarily, and I think you understand this, especially with wayward lives, that doesn't necessarily set us up for the next thing. Where, where, where we skip time, where we think about time and what it actually means in the course of these people's lives. Um, so that it forces us out of these frames, you know, but but I think you do that beautifully because the you know the water has this kind of mythic quality. So there's like you know this um, almost a you know this biblical thing of you know before and after the flood. But what that but the water is also that uh, figure of rupture and um, and its tension with the house, not only in terms of the particularity of this you know of Betsy or of Katrina, but what does it mean for those who have a history of being displaced, those who have a history of being property, to pour so much longing and ideality into the figure of the house itself? And I mean, and I think that you do that so beautifully when you talk about your mother, and in a way, it's so um, it's so radical and so defamiliarizing. I mean, I do think of wayward lives in the sense because in the yellow house, um, the longing for a house, it's almost bigger than the longing for like the romantic couple, the, long, like, the longing for the marriage plot that somehow the house becomes this really important anchor of being this, the, the treasure trove for um, collective stories. So can you, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting because I think it, it really minimizes it to, to mm -hmm. imagine my mother as someone striving for an American dream. I don't think she gave a damn about the American dream. This house was the opposite of bondage, period. She yeah. thought, if I have a plot of land, if I have a place, and it was the same for my grandmother, you know, she was abandoned. She didn't have the 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 sort of signs and symbols of a kind of historical continuity that mattered to her. And so a home for her was continuity, a place where my family could come regularly every Sunday. And, and I think even now in my own spaces, that that's what homes and houses represent for me. And it actually has less to do with needing it to be there forever and more to do with the feelings you can enact in it. It's a, it's, I think, a kind of freedom. Yeah, no, I mean, I was um, actually thinking of that, that it's so filled with like the desire of the ex-slave. And, and there was a moment in Julie Dash's Daughter of the Dust where the mother is calling her daughter and she has the, uh, and her name is I Own Her, right? Right, right. And it's precisely about that thing, which is the remedy um, and the antidote to one's condition of being enslaved. Um, but the house. This is also this very complicated space, too. Okay. Sorry, did I disappear? So I heard you say this is a very complicated space too. Oh, and you know, and I guess I was um, meaning the kind of the psychic dimensions of the house uh, so that it becomes the space, um, the holder of freedom dreams. It becomes the space for family stories. Um, it also becomes a space that's characterized by grief and loss and also by shame, by hiding. So I don't know if you want to just talk about its, you know, shift and movement over the course of the memoir. Sure. I mean, the house was so intriguing to me, not just as a basic metaphor, but the sort of psychic contours of it, right? Um, and I think that's where the philosopher Gaston Bachelard was useful to me 
um, and that it allowed me to sort of inhabit, go back and inhabit in a psychic way, um, the self as if it were the yellow house, right? And thinking about cabinets and doors and uh, windows. I was thinking so much at some point, I was obsessed with windows and I, I kept thinking, you know, the view from your window tells you so much about your lot in life, who you are, what's possible for you. And, and all of these things live somehow within us, right? And so to move from talking about this literal house to this psychic space where each of us, uh, 12 human beings, 12 children, uh, created a sort of self, right? A, a sort of um, position in the place. And we're all going through in very different and distinct ways, a kind of individual reckoning with what the house meant. And I think it's that, that was the work that, that led me to uncover the parts about shame because the shame realizing that my obsession with evidence, my obsession with, I just want to know the history of this place. I need it to be more than what it is psychically for me. I, I want to know where, who bought it before us and who owned it and where did it come from? That real yearning for, for some kind of evidence and structure, right, was based in a kind of limitation that I didn't all the way understand. I understood it when I started going to the archives and when I drove to Raceland, Louisiana, Raceland, right? Where my family, where my mother's family is from and where my father's family is from and saw that only a certain house had the history clearly laid out that if I wanted to find the history of the yellow house and think of it as a important place, I would have to do years and years of chain of title research. And I, I would literally have to go and spend hours, right? In the dusty basement, the, the actual toll uh, was so great. And I think, so the house morphed, I feel, over the course of writing it. it. It first was this place I was obsessed with and ashamed of. It then became a completely psychic space to the point where I started to, to design the book by saying, okay, my brother Daryl feels like this den, you know, and why is that? What, what does that recall for me? What does the space itself, right, say about Daryl? Why does he feel like the den? Um, to, to it ultimately becoming a piece about the inadequacy of, the, the evidence around the places where we stay, right? Um, that, that there could be no resolution for this, that, that we were not, we would have to, I would have to create a story that mattered from within, that I, I could not go without to find that story. Okay, so that, I mean, you've said so many wonderful things there. Um, uh, you know, one, when you were describing, thinking of, you know, your siblings and their character and relationship to spaces of the house. I mean, there's the wonderful schematic Morrison also drew of Beloved, where she's literally laying out the spatial relationships in terms of constructing the novel. But when you also talk about like, you know, narrating from the inside, that seems to be um, an approach that we might say also kind of troubles the line between something like, um, if not fiction and nonfiction, at least like say archival research and imagination. And again, beginning of the book, um, even in the portion you read, you know, what does it mean um, to have stories that don't have evidence or stories that are not shored up by documents? And how did you wrestle with that um, in the process of building the, the, the kind of the architecture that structures the yellow house, because there's such, I mean, there's the 
intensity of research, but yet there's this imaginative labor, right? As you try to honor stories that people have told you, even as you mark them as, you know, twice told and uncertain and your own imaginative labor that's required to, to go beyond where the archive ends. Well, I mean, that's sort of everything, right? We could we could have a party about that too. I mean, the thing about it is I wanted to do this thing where I didn't appear firmly in the narrative per se for the first hundred pages where, you know, I was just telling the story from a sort of omniscient perspective. Um, and that was really difficult in the fact checking phase because I was using, the way that I got most of those details was I was interviewing my family over the course of a year and recording those interviews. And then if someone said something interesting, I would go and have a kind of group interview with whoever was living, who was on the street at this time to see if someone could sort of confirm the story. And then I would try to go into the archive. And, but the, the limits are always there, right? Because people have died. We don't know for sure. And, and, and I thought that it should be perfectly normal that I would not exist in these first hundred pages because I technically wasn't there. Right. But that we understand that I am that if we're sitting on the porch telling a story. Right. This is how we would tell the story. Right. I, I, and I wanted it to sound that way. But the limits of the archive were hitting me in the face. And there was something very um, overwhelming about the act of collecting the evidence in the first place. I think all the time. Uh, for instance, going to the historic New Orleans collection, which is one of the places where I tried to find my father in the archive. And the historic New Orleans collection, you know, I, I think people would say it's a great building. It's beautiful. The architecture is fantastic. It's in the French Quarter. You walk in there. Everyone is staring at you. You you have to check your things in to a wooden locker you know, there are so many marble staircases to get to the actual room. And when you get to the room, the people who help you are behind 12 foot desk, you know, and and it is the arch as Carrie Mae Weems calls it, the architecture of power. You you feel cowed in that space. You 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 almost feel silly if you're a kid from New Orleans East, a black girl in there looking for your father. You know, and meanwhile, you go to the New Orleans Public Library, right? And and maybe that's a more welcoming space, but you know, it's also where the homeless people go um, to kill time during the day, and you have to be really careful. And you know, it, it's like you know, there's no attention paid to you. So I think there's something about how it's all set up, where these things are collected and stored the actual process of accessing the archive, which makes you uh, feel that it doesn't belong to you, right? And I think in the absence of that, what I tried to do was really use oral history, but, but more from an ethnographic perspective in a way, because I realized that I couldn't quite interview my family as I had first imagined. You know, they weren't having it, um, oh. but I could, be around them a lot with my recorder on, right? Um, and say, here I am with my recorder, right? And I could get closer and closer and closer to understanding certain things that I wouldn't otherwise. But often there was no way to check these things other than to have two or three people say the same, the same story. And, and so I think this brought me right up against all the work that you essentially do, um, thinking about the silence, the violence of the archive, um, because there often was no place for me to go. Yeah, I mean, that the story about um, finding your father in the archive um, and then losing him um, really touched me because, uh, I mean, obviously, the the yearning to find that that desire is so great, um, and then when you show um, these images to your mother, she's like, 
you know, oh, sweetie, no. What was that moment like? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's so interesting because there was some great point of pride I had, right? And I think this was part of my interrogation. So two things were happening with me in the archive. One, I was obsessed with uh, something that felt a little separate, which was, what do we know about the black woman wanderer? Right, because my mother was seeing me as just like a wandering person. Like, well, what's your goal in life? What are you doing? You're just sort of, so I felt like this sort of wanderer woman, right? And and so I here I was in search of this father of mine, who was, you know, this present absence, and feeling in some false way that I could restore him and find him in the archive, right? Which ultimately felt a little shameful that I even had the idea in the first place. But the pride I felt when I thought I found my father on first seeing him on the video and then going and hurriedly, you know, you know this moment in the archive when your heart is racing and you feel that it has something to offer you. And I remember going up to the majestic counter and, and saying, I need a copy of every one of these images and putting them in a manila folder and feeling quite accomplished and walking out of the historic New Orleans collection and just carrying my father in this archive for weeks and feeling shy about showing him, feeling some ownership over this thing that I had found. And that crushing moment when my mother, you know, all the fantasy of what it meant to have found him in the archive. And he mattered, right? Because he's in the French Quarter archive. And then realizing it wasn't him at all. But I mean, uh, you describe, you know, the hubris of your own desire. But one of the things I also love the way um, is the way you use uh, recorded speech. And often, um, you know, the the selections of, you know, um, your family's utterance uh, that you'll use are those remarks that will kind of like put you in your place a bit. Like, you know, I, I don't know if you're going to Burundi. Um, and you haven't received the Bon Voyage party. Right. No one seen you off at the airport. And is it your brother Carl? Yeah, I think my brother Michael was like, "Oh, you did get over yourself. Like it ain't that serious." Okay. I know. Why are you worrying about this? All and then so, Carl said something like, "Don't let the lions eat you." And I'm just like, "Okay, these people." Yeah. So I so again, even in those moments, your perspective is kind of contextualized by all of these uh, those other utterances. So, I mean, I wanted to ask you some questions um, that are also just about, I'm looking at the time, about the um, issues of form. And, um, and that is about just kind of generally, I mean, I know you read a lot of fiction and you actually said in one interview that you don't generally read the memoir. So I guess I wanted to know, you know, how is it that fiction shapes what you do um, as a nonfiction writer? So that's one question. And the other is, you know, what do you feel that you can do in your next book? What What is the lesson that you learned um, in the course of writing The Yellow House? What will you, you know, what risk will you take in the next project? Well, that's a good one. So um, in terms of reading, yes. So I'm mostly a fiction, I mostly read fiction. And I think I read fiction because I am obsessed with humans and character. I'm really interested in character. I'm really interested in interiority on the page, how, how you sort of write someone from inside out, you know, how you sort of, you know, for me, the trick, why I love nonfiction, frankly, is that it's more of a challenge, it feels like, to actually have to find, let's say, the magic in a certain year, right? Like, do all the work to find the story about Jesus in the glass, right? It, it, versus just making it up. And so I read fiction for that. But I think also, there is a kind of, like, for instance, the writer... Um, Alberto Moravia or um, um, 
uh, David Grossman. There's a kind of like um, interior philosophical fiction that I really gravitate toward. It doesn't end or begin explicitly. It's um, carried along by an idea somehow. And, um, you know, and, and I find that, and I think that's why I'm obsessed with um, also the poets, because I, I'm trying to figure out how to be concise with language. I feel that I am a lover, a true lover of language. And I got that from my mother. And I just, before I answer my, about my next work and what will be in it, you know, it was really significant to me um, to take my mother's voice, which is really the way she says things are, are more elevated than even I can say things. And to talk about a person who is a self-trained person, who is an autodidact, who, who is ordinarily, you know, shunned, cut out, not thought to know anything, and to have her be a kind of force field in the work. And, and also to constantly remind the reader that I came from her, she made me. That there is not any distinction, no matter what register, any of my siblings are speaking in, we came all from this one person. So it's it's a kind of way, I think, of deeply interrogating what we think about when we think about thought and accomplishments and ideas and all that. But in terms of the next work, you know, that's a hard question, but I think the biggest thing is just mm -hmm. knowing that I won't have the same expectations I, I think that when I was writing The Yellow House, I really didn't understand. I believed so much in evidence. I, I still had this journalistic way of seeing things that, you know, everything can be found. And if it's not written down, you know, um, it, it obviously means all sorts of complicated things. But if we keep working toward it, right, it can exist. And now I think like a polar opposite way, in a polar opposite way, which is that I don't seek for anything <laughs> to exist in that precise way. And I'm more interested in following the question of the Black woman wanderer and really sort of bursting some new frame, you know, and, and standing outside of the thing I've already done which does feel actually very composed to me and very formal in a way. And so I think this book sort of took me to a position where I feel I can play differently, you know? Yeah. No, no, I was wondering, um, I mean, I know you've been reading a lot of very short forms. So I was like trying to guess like, oh, is she working on? Um, <laughs> you know, not, look, we're just alike in that way. No way it helps. <laughs> talking about that <laughs> <laughs> um but 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 on that note in terms of the way in which the work is formal and composed i mean there's definitely a narrative restraint in the yellow house but i thought that that restraint um was really important here and part of that restraint um for me, it felt protective at times, right? Um, it felt like, oh, um, you know, that the reader could come in with along the path that you carved, right? And so there was something about the the formality of the telling that felt very organic, and um, and I guess I was thinking about. Um, you know, Edrich Danticat's brother, I'm dying. Yeah, and I, I felt that restraint too, also um, in terms of the way you just explored this long history of dispossession. I mean, this book could be just, you know, um, a critique of racial capitalism, dispossession, predatory accumulation, all of that is the backdrop. You know, all of that is the context for the yellow house. And um, you're like, yes, that is its context, but the story will proceed. 
And at some point you actually say um, that, uh, do you say um, Katrina was what, do you say it was the punctuation or it was the afterthought that somehow right. it's not as if the experience of Katrina doesn't like articulate for the first time all of the brutal forces that are at work in this dispossession, but it's a kind of a punctuation of that. But yet life unfolds in that context, right? right. And in that Text, people clean their house every day and people make curtains and they sew lovely dresses and they go to their social clubs. Um, and it seemed that there was, you know, a kind of exquisite balancing act that was required to just hold all those pieces of the story together. You know, it's interesting because that really brings us to the, just a conversation about form and structure. And <clears throat> I see structure as a kind of boat in a way. And I, I want to be able to move these ideas along, right? And and I I need to put them in something. And and that that way of that for me creates, I think, a necessary detachment so that the whoever the narrator is of that particular story can can actually be separate and apart from me or my understanding of myself. And, and I think a lot of Jamaica Kincaid when I talk about this, because I think about, if you think of a small place or you think of her book, My Brother, um, and she does, she has this wonderful essay, Biography of a Dress, um, that really like the history of all these interesting things, right? Encapsulated in a dress. And there's a way in which her structure allows her a kind of, it's like a frame and she can be outside of it in a way that I think is useful when you're writing nonfiction. And, and it and also feels necessary because I am the kid who was doubly named. Um, right. Right. And, Monique and Sarah. And that I think had to become part of the story, right? And I think that's the tricky part. And that's the thing I'm thinking about in the later drafts is, okay, all of these ideas that are kind of riding on top, how do I submerge them? And so there's a whole thing that I'm interested in having to do with names and naming and, and who we are on paper and beyond paper and what you decide to call yourself, what a street is called, right? All, there are all of these, what New Orleans East and the way it's name called. Um, and put down. And so that idea of naming can sort of ride in the, you know, throughout the text. Um, and, and there I am with my double names feeling deeply exposed, you know, for, for even having written, you know, this is the familial and familiar name, but yeah. feeling too that. Um, you know, I can't put other people on the line if if I'm somehow not on the line. I mean, I, I think that that restraint um, actually allows like multiple stories to emerge or it allows you to um, sit in this space of not fully knowing. And um, and and I and partly you were saying about like having different characters, almost like respecting the autonomy of voice because there's your brother Daryl's accounting of his place in the family. And so there's one, a chapter ends with his recounting and mm -hmm. he talks about, um, he raises questions and he describes himself as the black sheep of the family. And then the next chapter begins with an entirely different kind of narration. And I thought that that was so, um, you know, beautiful because what we see is the kind of, the multiple ways that this story can be told and accounted mm -hmm. for, but the restraint um, and you know the need not to pin down his account and verify it against this other telling is what allows those kind of multiple stories to literally exist side by side. Right, which feels which feels more. I mean, that's such that was so important to me because I wanted 
to find the ways of complicating what we have normally read when we read familial or familiar stories, especially about Black families, right? That, that somehow people are not always allowed to sort of interject or come in and, and, and take the mic and say their part um, and have, you know, there's this moment where my mother is talking about, you know, you know, sex with my father and not wanting to crush babies. And, 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 and as the narrator, I say, you know, when people tell you their stories, they can say whatever they want. And, and that was, that moment was instructive for me because I thought this is a moment of flourishing. In other words, this is the story I can't find in the historic New Orleans collection. So when people tell you their stories, let them say whatever they want. And, and it, it should appear, right? Um, because I think it had the effect of giving these humans a kind of dimensionality that allowed them to breathe in the work. So no one became a character in the tropish sense. No one, you know, Carl for me, you know, there's something very, I think of Maroons often, and even I just saw Carl recently in New Orleans, and he's just that guy, you know, he lives off the grid and he doesn't really want to know. And, but there's, but I never wanted him though to become this singular thing, right? Or, or a characteristic that even he in the book, you know, has this fighting moments and this moments of anger. And, and also when he talks about Katrina, you feel the depth of emotion and the fear. And, you know, um, that was the work. I'm excited though, not to be talking about them in the next thing, you know? Yeah. You know what? I was going to ask you and then how, what was the response? Because it is a book where, I mean, you're all exposed. I mean, you know, again, with restraint, with tenderness, with respect, but yet there is this exposure. And since so much of the economy of the Yellow House was about secrets, was about privacy, was about not letting strangers into the house, what was that experience like of, you know, I mean, I know your mother is terribly proud of you, but still, what was it like for your siblings and your mother to, you know, to read the Yellow House? You know, I think that they, the process of interviewing them was useful because I did it over the course of a year in a very kind of structured way and and reminding them often that, you know, I'm working on this project and I'm recording you. And, and so I think the process of that recording took them a long way to just feeling like, oh, this was the story I wanted to tell, right? And, and this, thus the story belonged to them in some very specific way. Um, and then I, I think because I was so careful along the way, that really helped. But the whole thing was gut-wrenching. I mean, people have had different reactions. You know, Daryl said he highlighted his name everywhere and, you know, and I owe him. Like everyone is sort of you know, I have siblings who haven't read it. My mother is sort of like, I, I don't really care about it. You know, I mean, it, I think it's been useful for me because it was the story I needed to tell. And, I, and it was very hard to think about a world where all these characters could exist um, and, and I'd be pulling from some from the idea of fact or fact or their stories as they remember the memory. Um, and, and I think they're still trying to negotiate, you know, what it all means, but, um, I don't think they'll have to go through it again. <laughs> <laughs> but so no, no hints at all about the next project uh, or no. no, I don't, I don't want them to collapse, you know? No, I, I, I'm the same way, but I think Bernard is coming with some, with some questions from our audience or? Yeah, thank you both. Um, the audience asked good questions about um, <clears throat> your ideas of the archive and also uh, trying to figure out what, what role something like Katrina played in 
thinking through uh, how you uh, told this story, and I think I think those those are topics that have been sort of touched on, and and then some. Um, I I had a question which I, I wanted to address to both of you around um, just your writing process and moving between research and composition and circling back to research and you know just sort of one of those paris review interview questions are you working with pad and pencil um and, and along those lines you know tips for people who um are, are eager to tell stories even their own stories but maybe not from a purely journalistic or scholarly point of view um I was thinking as you were talking, um, you know, about oral history, but also about something like Richard Holmes's footsteps, where uh, sometimes you just got to go walk the places that you're meant to write about and imagine your yourself back into in, into earlier days. Um, so that's it, really. You know, tips for people who who sort of want to do the kinds of work that you both do, which is so hard to categorize. Sarah, first, you first. <laughs> I hear your answer. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's so interesting. I mean, I I write with a pen and a pad. Um, I there has to be this physical connection for me between the words, my brain, the the sounds of the words. So I usually draft things by longhand, and. Um, and I and I mean I, there's something that Sarah said earlier, which is you know I think for people who write nonfiction, um, there's a certain way we're activated by limits because I think that the you know you like how you find your way to story, um, and I guess the general the way I would kind of generalize that as advice is just like you know work on those things that really excite you just kind of find your way to a way of working um and writing through the process but you know um i think that i work very intuitively and very organically and that's the the experiments with form comes through the process it's not like i begin and saying oh i want to trouble the relationship between this and that um, it's in struggling to figure out how do I tell the story that I find my way to a formal means of articulating it. I think, and, and I, I love that. I, I think for me, just on the research part, and I'm also a hand, writing by hand person. It's almost the only way I can draft something. Um, but for research, I can really live there for really long periods of time. Sometimes I have to rest myself uh, because I just want to sort of do more and more and more. And one thing I learned is at some point you just have to stop um, and and start writing. And you can always go back and you can always keep a list of agitating things as I like to call them, or questions or things that really are nagging you, um, a direction you want to go back and go into. But, um, you know, I, I think, I mean, for me, the the sort of layering feels so natural. I, it feels just part of who I am. I, I can't imagine writing without thinking about all of these sort of films that lay on top of each other, especially here as a Black woman and living in America. Um, so I would second this idea in the sense that you find your your own route, you know, and um, and try to make something that makes the most sense to you and your own sensibility. Thank you. Um, one more question uh, before we close. And um, in thinking a lot about the work that you've done, uh, in archives, what you can what you can find and say about what you found and what you go looking for, and and can't turn up and how you how that says as much about the archive as it does the questions that you, you know you're asking. Um, uh, 
one interesting fact about the programming that we've done at at at, uh, at the Y here with literary figures like yourself is um, this enormous data set of uh, instances where what was happening uh, in the, the world at large uh, intersects with uh, what uh, authors and artists are 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 talking about on our stages, virtual or otherwise. You can come up with all sorts of moments across the 80 years of our history, whether they're the outbreak of war or an assassination um, or, or something like a hurricane and, and see what people said in response in their public utterances on occasions like, like this one. Um, and uh, I don't, uh, mean to put you on the spot and i don't even know if this is a question so, so much as uh an invitation but you know we're we're headed into an election vortex almost this is the last event on this side of um of the trump presidency and i'm just curious how you all are thinking about things if you've already voted um i'm not asking you to, to make a protect a, 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 a prediction of course uh or, or, or prognosticate but just you know, your reading and, and thinking and how it's um, uh, kind of is articulated um, by what you have to say about, uh, you know, these days. Sarah, do you want to say do you oh, want yeah. to address? I, mean, I feel like we've talked a lot today. <laughs> Fair enough. You don't have you don't have to say anymore. This idea. Do you want yeah. to add anything? I mean, I, I think um, you know um, in the essay uh, that I wrote, um, "The End of White Supremacy in American Romance," um, that partly it's kind of reckoning um, with the historical formation of this republic and its deep, deep roots in, you know, white supremacy and settler colonialism and so much, and the brutalities of capitalism, right? And so much of this moment is about really having to confront and wrestle with that formation. It is so naked. Um, I was talking with a friend and we were talking about these great, even late 19th century writers like Charles Chestnut, right? And the marrow of tradition or Ida B. Wells or Du Bois and the way in which they reckoned with um, their respective moments seeing an ascendant you know, kind of white nationalist, white supremacist order and how they met that. And I think we were looking at their example uh, as a way to think about what is required of us. I mean, what is required of us, you know, uh, in the nightmare scenario of 45's, you know, re-election and what is required of us um, if we return to the you know the the norm of neoliberalism which is um less brutal which is not american fascism but which is still brutal so we're at this very very hard moment and i um i think a lot is required of us as writers as people who are thinking in the world and i think uh um you know a huge responsibility is not uh you know, respecting um, the norms of the given that whatever happens after November 3rd, there's a huge fight before us uh, to, you know, to transform, um, to transform the norms of life in the U.S., regardless of who wins. So, so that's what I would say. Well, that's it. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye. Good night.